We go back, don't we? Yes. We do. What was the name of the movie business? Real.com. Real.com. Oh, R-E-E-L, yeah. right? Yeah. Not yeah. the one, the other one, the other real.com. No, that's now we're the real real. Yeah. Um, so, so the real, explain what it did for people. It was the first site to sell movies. Right, and you sold them how? I remember the old, this is like video, you know, this is so beyond most of the, I see someone smiling, that's old right. enough to remember. Right. It's when you had cassettes and you had to go to Blockbuster to rent them. Yeah. And we sold them and then we made this big transition to DVD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big one. Yeah. But we were still selling. Um, and we were like 25 million in 18 months. And yeah. then there's a company called Hollywood Video. Right. That bought, it. that bought it. Which owned video stores. Which owned video, video stores. And they bought us to kill us thinking they would kill the industry. Right. And Jeff Jordan was the CFO. Wow. Um, of Hollywood Video. Oh, wow. But he buried that in his resume. Yeah, I bet he did. Um, <laughs> Jeff Jordan's a venture capitalist was at eBay and yeah. things like that. And then you moved on to Pets.com. I then, did. And then, and then how do you, let me, we've talked about this before, but how do you reflect on that? Because a lot of things that you guys were doing is now, well, you know, there's it, tons of well, stuff. Well, there's multiple Amazon. ways to reflect on it. Yeah. Well, timing's everything. Right. Right? So if you look at Chewy.com, went out with a great multiple. I don't know how they're doing today. They went public. Chewy.com is like the 2.0 version of pets.com. Uh -huh. So I look at it, timing's everything. My timing was off. I didn't start it, but I was brought in to run it, and I really thought we could do it um, because I never raised enough capital to get us to profitability. The other thing is I also look at the way the media treated me as a female CEO mm -hmm. versus the, and they're still, you're still asking me about it. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen one interview where the CEO of Intel has been asked how Webvan did and why he went I, I actually did ask him, but go ahead. Good for <laughs> you. No, but, but I mean, in general, it's but, but not, talking, it doesn't No, but I want to know what him. you, I don't, I don't think it was a failure because I think it was the way things. It was things, too early. It was too early. That's too right. Early. Right. I, I mean, people like to make fun of it, but actually it was a lot of the stuff you were doing is what everybody does now. It's, but what, did you, what did you take away from that experience? What do you mean in terms of? Like, what did you think was what missing? Looking what, I'm looking money. for money. Money, just money, money. just capital. And money. also the timing that people weren't used to delivery the way no, they No, 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 it really was, if we would have, uh, there's a lot, but if we would have raised probably another 200 million, right. people weren't writing those kind of checks, the company would have made it into profitability. And, and, and would have kept going. I just, I yeah, do think, probably I probably would have kept going. I don't know. I, I don't think people were ready for the idea of well, it. Because Webvan we didn't work, even though it's. Well, Webvan groceries are still hard. Right, right. But pet food's pretty easy mm -hmm. because people, it's a replenishment. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah. So, so what, what, what I want to get to is that you, you then started this company and you wrote me a note, which I, I did. posted, saying I have this interesting idea to do the real world. This is about eight years ago. Yeah, eight, almost eight years um, to the And date. I thought it was fascinating that you went into that. Like it was a very, it was a sort of orthogonal, though the same business. Um, talk a little bit about that journey, a little bit about where you so, feel you are now. Oh, now? Yeah. Um, well, now we're just like, how big can we get? I mean, we're, we really are like a change agent. So the interesting thing about when I started it, um, I, I have a basic premise that when you start a business or when you get an idea, mm -hmm. that idea is floating out there. It's like not just your idea. Somehow, like if you've got it, like 20 other people mm -hmm. have it at the same time, and then at least some of those people will get funding. So you have to execute really quickly. Mm -hmm. And there's no, I mean, in this case, a lot of people got funded for the resale around the same time we did, 2011, well, we got funded in 2012. Right. And the difference is that we went into this space that I thought was a complete white space mm -hmm. where people were, I thought eBay couldn't, I thought we would originally take the top off eBay and the bottom off Sotheby's and Christie's. Mm -hmm. And the truth is we've redefined the market. We're, where we are is bigger than the market. And everyone else went to do like an, e I'm an eBay fashion site, I'm an eBay, you know, they all went self-posting. Mm -hmm. And I went the other way. So why did you do that? What was the thing? Well, it's a huge opportunity. What I didn't realize when I saw, if you just back up, I was shopping with someone you know, mm -hmm. Aunt Winblad. Yep. And she bought um, consignment. The well-known venture capitalist. She's a well-known venture capitalist. And we were in a boutique that had a little bit mm -hmm. of luxury consignment in the back. And she bought back there. Mm -hmm. And I was so interested in why she bought consignment, because she said she'd never walk in a consignment store. She would never shop on eBay at the time. Those were your options. And yet she, like, that's where she spent her money. And she said, well, I trust the owner that these goods are real. I got a great deal. I bought, you know, Louis Vuitton, Prada, Gucci at a great price. Who cares if they're previously owned? Mm -hmm. And I thought if you have someone who has a lot of money 
that is value driven toward beautiful things, then I, it made me want to research the luxury market. And in the US, it's like, at that time it was in the high 70s, it's like $90 billion a year in personal luxury goods go into the US. And that's before fine jewelry and watches. Mm -hmm. So it was a white space. And then it happens, when it goes in, it piles up. And then what happens? You know, five years later, in your own closet, you've got probably, well, Frost and Sullivan estimates there's $198 billion worth of trapped value in people's homes, mm -hmm. and that's the discounted value. Right, okay. Just sitting there. So I thought, why not? I mean, you know, you can add value, which means gives you a higher take rate, mm -hmm. but it has to be authenticated. So talk about the journey of going public, because you went out with a big boom, the stock is down now. Talk about where you, where, where, how do you look at how people are looking at your business right now? Um, well, I think we have to educate the market. I mean, mm -hmm. I was, do I told you, I was meeting with investors before this. Uh, no one's done this kind of a business before, but certainly there's been value added marketplaces before, mm -hmm. which is what we are. And I think it's education. I don't, we only, we reported, we beat our estimates on the first quarter. I think this is one of those businesses. Your, your, your revenues in the last year were? 711 million GMV. Okay. But I really believe that it's gonna take a while for people to understand our business and how it fits in. Because the what would they were, you know, whenever you go public, in order to set a valuation, you have uh, competitive, you have not competitive but comparable businesses, right, right. and they peg you off that business to understand what you're worth. And we were um, our primary comp was Farfetch, and Farfetch just took a hard left and went a whole different direction. And mm -hmm. they said they started, they bought a brand and they bought this and they bought that and the market went, whoa. And they said their growth was, they had to reestimate their growth. Mm -hmm. And so when they reported that, we automatically dropped. So I'm not that worried about it, it's one so quarter. So how, how, when you talk about educating people, what do you, you went public much quicker than other. Eight years. Well, eight years, but a lot of yeah, like, eight years. I don't know, Airbnb's still not public. Well, Pinterest is still not public. Uber took forever to go public. But you know, it. I. Look, at the end of the day, you have to go when you think you're right and mm -hmm. where, you th where your business is predictable and you have enough value that you're not gonna end up in a small cap. And um, our business is highly predictable. Our growth rate's still strong. We have a really strong path to profitability. And it felt like a good time to get out there. And the other thing is we were in all these, like um, when people were talking about us, they were talking about us like this is the resale market. And, even the press wasn't differentiated where we sat versus um, eBay or other people that got funded and some of them have gone out of business. So us being out there and, t and being able to tell our story, we think is a good thing. And our business is highly predictable. It meaning that you know? We know, we know, we know how to uh, get, we're a supply driven market mm -hmm. because everything we bring in sells. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I can tell you within a good accuracy level, what my product sell on, how I get product in, so I can, t I can forecast my growth and predictability, and we do, we are moving toward profitability in the next couple of years. So. so the idea, but the idea of what you're doing, I think some of the people, I know being misunderstood is every CEO's problem, I get that, um, but when you, when you look at what's misunderstood, I think the worry is that it's not, one is that it's not a big, it won't keep growing in the way it does, is that it won't, but you say it's your supply constraint is all. Yeah, it's not, a, I mean, really, it's just about getting, look, our biggest competition is people doing nothing. Right. So more than 70% of our consigners at one point had never consigned, now it's like 50% have mm -hmm. never consigned before. Right. So once they start consigning and they realize they have all the stuff they're not using yeah. and they can get money and then if they want to buy new, great. The most of them do buy new with the money they make. Mm -hmm. It gets them thinking about recirculating goods. So that's, that's our biggest challenge is just getting people used to consigning. And then you have the younger generation, the millennials and Gen Z, which are our single largest group. And How they, much of a market shares that of yours? Uh, well, that group's our single largest group. It's about 35%. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's still a nice, and men are up and coming in that too. But they're also really worried about sustainability. 
Mm -hmm. And when you, when you ask them why they buy or consign, it's because of sustainability issues. And when I say, where are you moving away? They move away from fast fashion. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a consciousness that getting these goods recirculated, especially goods that are made well, is good. Mm -hmm. And it's starting. It's slow, but it's starting. But when I started the company, we always were talking about getting goods recirculating. Right. But no one, no one uh, got played it back. And the la that group played it back, meaning meaning what do you mean? that when you say, "Why are you doing this?" Mm -hmm. you know, open ended. Why do you consign? Why do you buy consignment mm -hmm. or previously owned goods? No one was saying sustainability or I'm worried about the environment. And now that that drumbeat is really loud in that group. Mm -hmm. And so you're appealing to that as it, from a marketing point of view. Well, no, we are that. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, we are that. Well, yeah, I, I would say we're reason. more, oh, no, we're, com we're completely recir we're recirculating goods. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't, if I would have said, I'm going to start this company, recirculates goods, no one cared. Right, right. So talk a little bit about your retail locations, because that's another part of it. You know, Glossier is trying that up with, there's sort of pop-up shops. There's one in L.A., I think it's, a a permanent, it's a permanent one, one yeah. but they, they do smaller ones. They do some, but they're sort of experimenting. They're not that many of them is mm -hmm. all. Talk about, you have, is it 10? No, no, we have three. Three, okay. But uh, but some sort, you're in stores or? No, no, no just, three. just three. Just three. But I mean, we plan to open about two a year for the next so five years. So talk about why you, what is the, the, uh, well, the what we, behind you it? know, we ran pop-ups first and yeah. what we found is people, it changed people's perception of what we do. Mm -hmm. And when they walk in, they get more engaged engage with the brand and then there's a whole group of people that instead of us coming to your home or sending it in they just like to drop stuff off right and they want to talk to someone about their goods in the store and they're more comfortable and so it also became a good source of um, consignment for us so it's really been great actually I've been surprised this morning I was there I was walking in and so there's was, one in New York well there's two now two New there's York. one in Soho on 80 Wooster one on 71st in Madison the mm -hmm. one in 71st in Madison small mm -hmm. one in Soho's well we, we I'll tell you that was our first one mm -hmm. it's um we learned a lot we didn't men are really engaged with that store and they have a pretty bad space so mm -hmm. there's one in LA where we made the men's section really large mm -hmm. and almost equal to the women's and then we made more consignment offices more con but where people could drop off drop things. off stuff yeah. so the idea is for drop off or for just getting the as a marketing well, well it's everything really we sell a lot uh, we get a lot of consignment so I can talk about I mean now we're public I have to watch what we say but in the S1 um, the store in, in Soho, which is our oldest store, at that time was doing $5,000 per square foot. Mm -hmm. Half of it was product coming in, half of it was sale. So you, what do you think is the most important? You're not gonna have the hundreds of stores. No, it's more of really, it's a good market. How many vehicle. do you imagine? Like 15 maybe. In key markets. In key markets. Right, so you wouldn't do something like, uh, so La Tote just bought, which is a rental service, just bought Lord & Taylor for $75 million, which is astonishing when you think what a big brand that had been many years ago. What do you, do you have interest in doing that? No, I honestly, that was when we kept rereading the press release. We're like, wait a minute. But then they also said they, Explain. What well, no, because they bought a brand that is sort of a dying brand mm -hmm. and, but they're picking up some of their stores and their people, but they sort of raised the money. Do you, right. do you remember that? So yeah. they bought it if they could raise the money. Right. Um, it, I don't know their business, so it must have worked for them, but that right. was like a little bit of a head scratcher. I kept, we kept like, wait, who bought who? But right. that's all right, I'm, I'm sure there's a good reason. Probably not. Um, what, uh, <laughs> don't assume that. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not gonna you know say my anything saying. denigrating. You know my saying. I, Intelligence has its limitations, but stupidity is infinite. Um, it I'm works not, almost no every time on many com companies I cover. Um, I mean, you're always like, why did they do that? I'm like, maybe they're just stupid. Um, so. When you're, but, but you wouldn't think of doing a thing like that. Uh, tr uh, the, the idea, like you know, Amazon moving into stores. What? Well, we're building. Look, we're not buying Barneys. Let's just put that out there. Right. Okay. Good. <laughs> Is that a rumor? No, but it was about Farfetch. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. about Farfetch. And then they said we're not buying them, but they must have taken a look. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Okay. All right. Uh, no, that's all. We're not. Saying. We're gonna we're gonna build our own because. Um, no, I mean, there's, no, we're not. I don't know what's gonna happen to the department stores in general. What do you think? I think they're all in trouble. I think that, um, you know, 
having known all of them, I think it's interesting that uh, Saks, H, HBC, Hudson Bay Company is going to go private. I hope, I hope they can do that. It gives them time to reinvent. Mm -hmm. um, Neiman's has a ton of debt. I think they have more debt than mm -hmm. they have sales. Right. So that's always tricky. Um, they have to. Th they're really trying to thread a needle there. And then Nordstrom's, which again has their challenges, but at least they're experimenting a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think the department store is a hard model. What but would you? What would you? How would you reinvent it? There are so many ways. Mm -hmm. If you walk in, they're not. They're still not inviting. Mm -hmm. So you walk in and you feel like I'm not really sure because what happens is a lot of the brands pay for their space. And they're not well staffed, and then you know you have to walk through those. Perf I'm allergic to perfumes. So you have to walk through those counters. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's an engaging experience mm -hmm. at all. Um, I don't feel the need to walk. I don't know why I would walk in there versus shop online mm -hmm. because it doesn't really work for me. And I feel that way about a lot of retail. It's mm -hmm. not. I need more of an experience. Like if I felt like I was going to learn something or have really great food or be able to do something there or anything. Well, you see that everywhere. That the retailers. I was They're just really in a town. Oddly enough, I was in a town in Indiana this this weekend. I know. Whoa. I was in Mayor Pete. No, no, no. Okay. Um, and uh, in you know, he's from my hometown. Oh, is he? South oh, I did. Oh, good. Are you supporting him? I gave him a little bit of money. I okay. don't think he can win, but I'm glad he's got a good voice out there. Okay, good. He writes me like we're friends now. Oh, does he? Yeah. Okay. Are you? <laughs> no. Okay. He doesn't know, you know, the form letter. Yeah. Okay, I gave okay, him okay. like five hundred dollars. Okay. So we're wow. like tight. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so. <laughs> But you're from South Bend, so I know, but he doesn't know that. that. He doesn't well, know he that. Now he does. Um, so uh, I did an interview with him. He was interesting. Um, so I don't even know what I was asking. Anyway, I was there and I was thinking of the town in itself, Indiana. Indiana. It's besides the point. It, it was all experiential things on the street. There were no, and you could see the old signs from department stores and shoe retailers and things like that. It was really interesting to me, like what can survive in a in a retail environment. Oh, I right think now. there's a lot of things that can survive, and that, but you have to create an interesting environment. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, like, why are our stores, I bet you today, we're, on average, we get 800 to 1,000 people through that store a day. Mm -hmm. And so why do they do it? Because the merchandise changes every day. Right, so it's interesting. So it's interesting. And we also have gemologists that can talk to you, and we do, you know, lectures and events. and. Um, and it's accessible. All those brands are there, mm -hmm. and you know it's like a treasure hunt. Um, and if you walk into Gucci, it's an interesting store. Mm -hmm. You know, so you get people engaged with that, which is right down the street. Mm -hmm. And then you walk in almost every other store, and it's the same old model. It's like people standing around; they're sort of pissed off that you walked in because then they need <laughs> to talk to you. Right, right. And they've got a lot of attitude. Right. And then, like, and the other thing I find interesting, if they have something, but it's not in your size, it's another store, yeah. no. Because yeah. I, I, it must be a commission structure thing, because they're yeah. like, no, nah, 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 you know. Yeah. This looks good. I'm like, it's three sizes too it's small. Too, right, yeah. right. So when you think about that, when you, do you prefer the online? Do you, your business is going to be I'm largely mostly online. an online shopper. You're yeah, online. our business is like 95, 98% online. 98% online. Yeah. How does that innovate? Because that could also have the same problems. How do you see your business innovating? I think we just have to keep pushing it with personalization. Um, most of our business is now mobile, mm -hmm. and we have a thing called My TRR. We can build your own sales and mm -hmm. notification. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we do do, which is really fun, we bring in our experts into towns to just talk about how, mm -hmm. like, what's the best thing to consign, how things are made, the value of a Rolex versus other brands, Cartier, and how they create like amazing diamonds. So I think education. But I'd say. The one thing we have going for us that most marketplaces don't, all the product on our site's unique mm -hmm. because we take possession of the goods. So it's only on our site. It's mm -hmm. not everywhere, which helps people coming back. Right. So you don't have to worry about Amazon getting right. Kind of stuff. Right. Or could they? Well, I, I always think Amazon can do whatever they want. It would mm -hmm. just cost them a lot of money and they'd have to do reverse logistics. They wouldn't get a lot of synergies. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're thinking about um, you know, how Rent the, Rent the Runway and a bunch of traditional retailers are offering clothing rental services, would you, did you ever think of doing that? No, I think it's, a, I mean, well, Rent, rent the Runway is an interesting model. A lot mm -hmm. of people use it. I think it's also one of those ideas where you can, don't have to invest a lot of money 
and you get something new all the time, so it plays to that. I mean, I know Jennifer talks about sustainability. I haven't mm -hmm. seen the numbers on that because they dry clean all the time, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming it's more sustainable than fast fashion, right, which right. ends up in a landfill. Um, I think it's a cool model. I mean, look, when I met originally, because I've been meeting with the brands trying to convince them we're not bad, we're good, and most, like, some brands get What's it. What's your pitch? We're not bad, we're good. Well, look, it, in eight years I paid out, a, you know, if you can't get them on the sustainability, which, mm -hmm. like, they'll listen to you, but they're like, hmm, now they're starting to come around because the governments are making them come around, and especially in Europe. But I, it took me eight years to pay out a billion dollars to people, mm -hmm. my consigners, and the next billion is going to be a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And what do my people do? They go out and buy new. They get their money. So I'm an engine back into their That's stores. True. Yeah. Well, it's true. We, I mean, every survey we show sees that. So, and we're a new model, and you sort of have to pay attention. So I met with... Um, Monsieur Pinot at Karen, mm -hmm. and he said, I look at, there's three women that are changing the face of, of business and retail mm -hmm. in the world. It's you, it's Jennifer Rent the Runway, and it's Katrina with Stitch Fix. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know where it all goes, mm -hmm. but you guys are the change agents for the next generation, and mm -hmm. I think that's true. Why I do think, you think there's room for all of them. them. But, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't rent do rentals, because Stitch Fix is buying, Yes. This is Stitch Fix. I, I figured. I yeah. know you're a fan. I no, I, I'm not a fan. It's because I'm simple and androgynous, and they figured I, I it read out. that. <laughs> I, I listened. I've listened. And then you were sort of pissed, and then you got over it. Well, they were accurate. So <laughs> I couldn't argue. I was insulted, but they were accurate, right. and therefore I had to accept their sense of Same thing. All right. No, it was true. I couldn't deny it. Okay. So there you have it. And so I'm very happy. I bought six of these coats, and I'm done for the year. So um, uh, I actually am trying out your thing. I'm going to consign some stuff. I have some stuff my mom gave me. Oh, good. I was good. going to say, it was not most, mine. Okay, not, good. You know, the Gap doesn't sell very well on, 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 on your business. Um, but I have some stuff. I'm going to see how it works. I have a very old Bill Blast dress I'm going to try out. That would be vintage. Vintage. Yeah, oh, I don't know. That may what? do well. Uh, so, uh, look. Don't even. Let's, we'll talk right, later. We won't go there. But, but um, look, we get a lot of people that buy and then reconsign. Right, right. And that's sort of the same idea. Of a rental. Okay. Of a rental, but you've actually got something of value, so you can keep it as long. As long as it's um, a luxury good that retains its value right. and it's in good condition, we get reconsignments all the time. We call them round trippers. I reconsign all the time, so yep. I buy and reconsign. And we see people that use it. They buy their spring wardrobe. They sell their fall stuff. Okay. And then so that's like renting. Uh, it's a different form, but right. but I see, we see that behavior quite a bit. Oh, that's interesting. So fast fashion has been uh, tied to global and economic climate patterns and crises. What is the, the future of the garment industry if it's this oh recycling? My gosh. Well, you know, oh, it's, few, I mean, it's going to be hard. But look, the supply chain reengineering is long in coming, mm -hmm. and. It affects a lot of people's lives. Um, it's really going to be hard to change, but it, depending on who you talk to, fashion in general is either the second or third largest polluter in the world. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some kind of change. And the question is, how fast can it happen? So I just listened to a bunch of uh, talks at another sustainability conference that mm -hmm. happened in China, and you could hear people struggling with the trade-off of employment new technologies that the industry wasn't adopting or and had no government pressure to adopt mm -hmm. um, except a couple of clients like patagonia has been a leader sure have, yeah. um, stella mccartney's been a leader but these are pretty small in the grand scheme of things and it's really a big issue I, it's not going to be easily solved mm -hmm. and how do you think about you know if we have a recession or something else like what how does what what is the biggest challenge to your business and then we'll get questions from the audience well um, the business is born out of a recession, really. Mm -hmm. When you think of it, the idea was 2010, and then I started 2011. I actually think we know we're changing the way people shop mm -hmm. and buy retail. So my bet is we do we get in more supply, and we're going to do more. We're, we, right now, I know we support the brands mm -hmm. during a really bad recession. We may be a replacement for some of it. And what I'm more worried about is not the luxury brands, because they've been fine. They've almost been recession-proof. It's the mid-tier brands. 
mm -hmm. like a coach or a Michael Kors that isn't quite luxury, I think they're really going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Would you move? Would you move up or down the down I the chain? I don't think now we're good. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to move down the chain. No. and sell mm -hmm. more stuff. No, we sell a lot of contemporary. Right. So we're good. Right. We've got a nice. We got a do nice you mind, basket. Do you, you imagine making that bigger, your basket? No, we're good. You're good. Okay. We're going to get questions in one minute, but I'm going to end on this question because you know you did mention this idea of being a woman CEO and sort of not getting asked about that and stuff. Is it you're one of the few women CEO leaders today? I think at this point. Um, do you want to, This is a sad stat. Yeah. When we went public, I asked Nasdaq to pull how many CEO women CEO founders, not co-founders right. took a company from fine funding to IPO. They came up with three. Which is one was in nineteen seventy two. All right. One was Katrina Lake of Stitch Fix and one was me. Three. Now there are women who have been co founders, but then you get to ten. Right. So it's and I really write that off to early stage investors. Are there's not enough women? Because I can tell you, when I was out raising capital, although I know cable's out here somewhere, but you were Series B, not Series A. Um, and the Series A, this <laughs> that was easy. No, it was never easy. Right. Series A, but Series A was really hard. And the only people that got it were European investors, e ventures, but they're European, so their mindset's more attuned to the luxury market, perhaps. And then Maha of Canaan. And she got it. She got it. She got it right away. And her part. And every other VC is like, mm, I don't know. See these shoes? I've been wearing them five years. I love these shoes. I'm like, <laughs> okay, dude, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and my favorite one, which was, um, you know, the luxury market's huge. You've got all this data, tons of data on how yeah. the size and how yeah. much is in the U.S. And then one of the VCs is like, you know, mm, I just don't think the luxury market's that big. I'm like, oh, really? Why? Where's your, where's your data source? Uh -huh. Oh, you know, it's a, it's sort of a melange of information. <laughs> All right, and the truth is, he had set up a pickup for his wife, uh -huh. and his wife only wore yoga pants and juicy. So, of course, and he's like, well, I still think it's like, well, because his wife, because that's how the early stage VCs are. Uh -huh. My wife doesn't isn't going to be able to do this, so therefore the market doesn't exist. Right. It's like. Uh, yeah. Anyway, and I then <laughs> and then the other thing he came back with like, oh, I don't know about this whole things don't have their own. I like that your many voice. I like no, because it's like that's how he talked. Because uh, he'd sit back, because you know they sit back because they know everything and uh, or VCs know everything. Yeah, they do. Okay. They do, and some of them have been more right than wrong. Right. Um, but anyway, he's like, you know, luxury space. I don't know. And then he went, went on this whole thing about. Um, Oh God! Now I lost my train of thought. Where was I? But it was a good one. It was. He it was good. All right. But um, oh, an authentication wasn't important because you know no one cares about fakes. I'm like fraud is a huge issue. People do care about fakes. Mm -hmm. And now the same one has invested in a resale company and writing articles about the power and the importance of authentication. Yeah. I'm like. <laughs> That's all right. Just get behind me, boys, because right. I'm. I've been there before you got there. All right. I'll be there when you're dead. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Now it's a great story. Uh, I know. I missed you, Julie. All right. <laughs> questions. Questions from the audience. Please have a question for Julie. Come on. Up you go. Right here. Questions. Questions. Anybody? Come on. Go ahead, Mom. Oh, go ahead. Oh. The more you sell, the more you get. That's how we lock you in, Lucky. You can't leave the cycle. <laughs> this is my mother. <laughs> Uh, who doesn't need the money? But um, <laughs> did you buy new? Did you buy new things with it? With the, you bought? What did you do with the money you made? Who knows? Okay, all right. Probably bought new. Wow! wow. Whoa! Really? Oh, she's a she's a VIP now. Oh, I. Okay, stop, mom. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all we know is mom's paying for dinner. But go ahead. Given the importance of the authentication. 
how do you control making sure that the product is real and you know how do you go through that process and do you have to continue to put more and more resources behind it as you grow? So there's a couple ways we do it. We have multiple points of authentication and training and there's new fakes coming out all the time. So the first thing that happens is if we pick it up, the, the luxury managers are trained. Then we have receivers that are trained. Then we have classes and then we have special, we have specialists for certain brands that are really high value items that are highly um, uh, knocked off. And so we have teams that do that, but it's training, retraining. Whenever we get a fake, we, we every single, we have uh, training every week deeply on the new fakes. Cause you know what happened? And the other thing is it's a little easier when you take possession of the goods and you have to pay someone, you know the person. All right, so when you know the person, you don't tend to get as many fakes as if you're self-posting. If you self-post things like you're saying, oh, it's a fake, it can go away the next day. And they, you know what, in fact, there's another story, I gotta tell the story. Right, go ahead, go so on. people, are, no, because it's a good story. So we do a little bit of vendor, and vendors tend to have the most fakes. A little bit of vendor that have overstock, so we get this bag, it was Prada bags. And they were all fake. You open the box, it's like glue. Like the glue like knocks you out. Right, okay. So what do we do? We confiscate the goods, right? right. So far, we've had two vendors that are fraudulent. They're bad actors, mm -hmm. really bad actors. And so I found out these two guys, they have relatives that are um, in Florida, just mm -hmm. saying, that are lawyers. Okay. Florida's a little dodgy. But here's what they do. They send thugs to, one of them sent thugs to my house. Wow. 10 o'clock at night to beat on my door. Because we don't give them back their goods because they're fake, right? right? And then my favorite thing is the first guy who did it, his wife, I guess, was in tech. So right. she called me, she goes, female CEO to female CEO, I think you should just give us back your bags. I'm like, you're a con artist. You married like a criminal. Right. You're not, you're not getting your bags back. Because, well, I think you're rude. I'm like, you're a criminal. Why do I care? And I hung up. I mean, really, I mean, what would they think they're dealing with? So where, mean, where did the bags go? Oh, we put them in a vault. Yeah. And then at some point we just, well those, because they all sue us. The real right. criminals sue you. Right. And then they think, the guy in Canada, we're like we had, he's like, I'm suing, you guys are horrible, you got all my goods. So he sues us with his brother-in-law in Florida. And we're walking through it like we have to depose him, right? Because right. now we're in trial. Well, he can't come in the country, why? Because he's a criminal, <laughs> all right? So it's like, I mean, these guys are crazy. And then they all cave because they're criminals. Do you know what? They paid us to go away. They sued us. They're like, we need you to drop this suit. We're right. like, you sued us. Right, right. And they're like, well, what will it take? I mean, pay us. Right, right. You sued us. Wait, right. pay, pay us. We'll go away. Right. These people are nuts. Okay, okay. And, I then, they, and then they <laughs> post on, wait, and then they post on other sites. They po they're all, they're everywhere. No, they never die. They just right. read, they just go someplace else. Right, why don't you start a, a service called the Fake Fake? I can, t we can tell you where you those fake are. You can put Donald are. Trump as chairman of the board. It'd be great. Oh, I'm not touching that. I'm not touching that. Anyway, thank you, Bye, Julie. Bye, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>